Hello, everyone. Welcome, Dartmouth people. What a crowd. This is incredible. My name is Robin Albing, and I'm the director of lifelong learning at Dartmouth. And along with my colleagues, Danielle Sparks, Pat Bedard, and Anna Haas, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for joining us this afternoon for this incredible event. It's an opportunity for us to learn more about Michelangelo, and it's an exciting opportunity to view this very special exhibit, Michelangelo, Divine Draftsman and Designer. And I think if any of you read the New York Times, it says that many of us will not see these drawings again in our lifetime. So this is really a pretty incredible exhibit. In alumni relations, we strive to create learning opportunities for Dartmouth alumni, family, and friends around the world through Dartmouth alumni travel. And yes, we are those people who send you those brochures all the time. We also have events on campus during reunions and homecoming and across the country through events like this, Dartmouth on Location. We have a few housekeeping things. Before we get started today, please turn off and silence your cell phones. After the talks, we're going to have a time for questions. Just a few. We have about 15 minutes for questions. We'll have two microphones set up in the aisles, so if you have a question, uh, there'll be some Dartmouth staff members here to help, assi help assist you, and uh, you can ask your questions. And also, the professors have told me that they will stick around for a little while afterwards to answer your questions. If you have not already viewed the exhibit, it is located in Gallery 899 on the second floor. If you go up the stairs, it's to your left. We ask that if you have signed up for the 6.15 viewing time, you wait so the exhibit does not become too crowded. We appreciate cooperation with this, and thank you very much for your cooperation earlier this afternoon. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Arguably, the one characteristic, one of many, I should say, that makes Dartmouth distinctly different from our peer institutions is that we foster a culture of scholars who love to teach. Today, we are lucky to hear from two such scholars who also happen to be incredible teachers. Jane Carroll is senior lecturer in art history at Dartmouth, specializing in art from the medieval times through the early modern period. Educated at Smith and UNC Chapel Hill, she has researched and written on art during both the reform of religious orders and the Reformation, focusing on how artworks argue for religious ideology. Her other research interests include early prints and works on paper, the role of women in the arts, especially during the Middle Ages, and art as political dialogue. Recently, she has expanded her research to explore depictions of marriage. Professor Carroll will discuss the collection and the impact that Michelangelo's work has had on, Western, on the Western canon. Darren McMahon is the Mary Brimstead Wheelock, Brimsmead Wheelock, Professor of History at Dartmouth, educated at the University of California, Berkeley, and Yale. Professor McMahon is the author of Enemies of the Enlightenment, the French Counter-Enlightenment and the Making of Modernity, Happiness, a History, and Divine Fury, A History of Genius, a recipient of major fellowships from the Mellon Foundation and the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. He is currently at work on a history of the idea of equality and is writing about lighting and illumination in the age of enlightenment. Today, Professor McMahon will discuss Michelangelo's reception as a genius figure. Please join me in welcoming our speakers for this afternoon's program. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm on already. I have some notes that I want to refer to because if not, I tend to go over. So here's where we're going to start. What I wanted to say is, and start out by saying, is something that I think Darren's going to pick up on. And that is the fact that what is universally acknowledged is that Michelangelo is a genius. And if you didn't know that, he would have told you. He had a very big ego. He had something 
that was almost an OCDC ability or desire to control his legacy. So what he did, he liked everyone to feel he did with godlike ease. For him, it was, it was as though drawing was supposed to be spontaneous, coming from his own sort of hand and becoming then this figure before you magically. You were to be in awe of it. And what we have, in fact, in his lifetime is the fact that he's called Il Divino, the Divine One. Something that he starts when he's in his 40s and continues through his life. So from that, we get the feeling of him, and in fact, Vasari talks about this, as being God-touched, touched by God. Which, when I, as a medievalist, when I listen to that, what it sounds like to me is hagiographies, those biographies of saints that were made to make you feel as though they were special and selected out of all the rest of us to be the one. And that is what Michelangelo wanted, is what he cultivated. He wanted also to control the narrative of his life, even in the afterlife, after his death. So what he does is he has two people write his biographies, his bio and he, that is during his lifetime. The first is Vasari. And Vasari writes in 1550, this magical book that we see as a foundational text for art history, The Lives of the Painters, Sculptors, and Architects. And if you look at that book, I don't, how many of you have read at least part of Vasari? Be proud, raise them high. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's good, yes. If you, when you look at the Vasari, when you read it, it is a very clear polemic. It starts with the idea, and Vasari was Florentine, that all art, all good art comes from Florence. Not surprising. And there's an arc throughout the narrative. And the arc is that we started out with this great artist and we ended up with the super divine artist. And that's Michelangelo. And that's where it ends. It is the largest biography. Fasari, while he was a friend of Michelangelo, did not study with him. But he definitely saw this man as someone he wanted to promote. Someone who he felt deserved your accolade. So Vasari does that 1550. Michelangelo reads it, and he doesn't like it. That all that, you know, angels weeping over his art doesn't really do enough. And so he goes to Condivi, and he says to Condivi, who's a friend, I need you to write a corrective. It's going to be an authorized biography, and I'm going to tell you what to write. <laughs> and he begins to create the myth of what he is. He takes away the part that says he studied with Ghirlandaio, which he did, and says instead that he is sui generis. He has taught himself by drawing. He knows what he is, do he, what he is doing. He doesn't need instruction, even at a young age. So the Condivi really begins to give us an image of Michelangelo that is mythic in proportion. And that's the one he likes, as you might expect. Um, and Vasari, when he went back and modified his lives in 68, 1568, really borrows a lot from Condivi and puts that into his own work. But we need to remember that skill does not come without practice. I was just thinking, what's a good example of this? And I was thinking how, <coughs> I don't know how many are skiers, but I've been watching Michaela Schifrin, who has, oh my gosh, there's somebody touched by genius. And she comes down the ski slopes and then she glides down with this amazing grace. And she makes it look so easy, and I know it's not. And I thought, we never see when we, she does that. We don't see the weight room. We don't see the, the, uh, the miles on the mountain bike. We only see the finished product. And so what the drawings do, Michelangelo's drawings, he let us see the weight room. They let us see what the practice is like that gets us to this divine genius. So, what I want to do with this today is to talk a little bit about what drawings do and how we're supposed to look at them, how we're supposed to see them. First of all, I want to just say that the majority of the drawings that Michelangelo does comes from, do chalk. They do black chalk or red chalk once he gets going. Um, but early on, he does the much more old-fashioned kind of drawing, which is pen and ink. When you get to red chalk, what you're seeing here Red chalk has a kind of softness. It feels like flesh. It looks like flesh should. It gives you the feeling very much as though you have a living, breathing form. Whereas a pen and ink is always a little stiffer. Mm. We have to think about it this way. They're working with a quill pen. 
So every time they want a line, they have to dip it in the ink, and it will run out, and then they have to go back and dip it again. And so there's a kind of stop and start with a quill of the pen and ink. So when he gets to chalk, when he gets to black and red chalk, which can take a point, it's got a little bit of oil in it, you can really, you can, it's a flowing line. The line begins to loosen up. And he gets a lot more creative with shading and how to create that sense of a body. What I like to call the topography of flesh. And he loves the topography of flesh. Um, what I want you to see, too, is that when you go through the exhibit, there are all different kinds of drawings. And if you know a little bit what to look for, you can sort of put the categories that we use. There's casual drawings, little doodles. There's, I'll show you some of these in just a second. And then there's the sketches you do to gain mastery, especially if you're a young student or you're attempting a new kind of position. You're trying to sketch to learn how to make that, get the muscle memory to make that figure. Then there's preparatory drawings or studies. You know what your subject matter is. You know what you're going to have to put together. But what you don't have is the actual idea of how all those pieces are going to fit together. So you do preparatory drawings, you do studies to get, try to get those ideas coalescing. Then the most complete is a cartoon. And there's be two beautiful cartoons in this exhibition. Uh, one I'm going to show you in just a second. The cartoon is really pretty much a finished product. You're going to use it, it's large, it's life size, to transfer a design directly onto a panel sometimes, but for Michelangelo it's almost always fresco. Um, some of the other people would use it for tapestry. Pretty complete. And then um, the last is presentation drawings. Few and far between, absolutely pristinely finished, and glorious compositions in their own right. And the ones they have upstairs from Tom for Tommaso de Cavalieri are stunning. So, I'm just going to, we're going to do a little category stuff. This is the doodle as we call it. This is the, the quick one. And this they have in the exhibition upstairs. There's a sonnet, and I love Michelangelo's handwriting. If you look at that, look how forceful that is. Mm. It's clear, it's precise, he's moving right along, and it has, it's, it's unlike anybody else's. It has this kind of um, clarity, and then he loves to end things with a little flourish. He likes mm. flourishes. He just, a little bit, I'm here. And on the side, he draws this little doodle. It shows him painting the Sistine ceiling, standing there. And the sonnet is about painting the Sistine ceiling. And he talks, he, he's just, he's whining, is what he's doing. The whole thing is how horrible it is, how his back hurts, the whole thing. And we see him standing there, reaching up with a brush. And I keep thinking, do that for a while, and all the blood runs out. This is not easy. And he, he let you know that. And the last thing he says, which is so charming, is he says, you paint like this and your face becomes the drop cloth. <laughs> All the paint's coming down on him. And so this is one of those off-the-cuff, beautiful little doodles that tell us something very personal. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> um, then there's mastery, trying to master the entire compositions, of various compositions. The early one that we have here, the very early, from 1490, uh, is when he's still very young, and he's actually in, although he would not admit this later, he's actually in Ghirlandaio's <coughs> studio. Uh, he's going around Florence, and he's looking at frescoes, and he's copying figures. And if you, they have some of them upstairs, though not the one I chose. Um, one of the things he's doing, it's pen and ink, so to get any kind of shading, look closely at this. He's doing big, he's doing tiny cross-hatching which means you take your pen and you make little lines in one direction, then you take your pen and make it little lines in another direction. It's tedious. It's, it is um, probably the greatest excuse to go to chalk is, that you know. And here what he's looking at are bulk, figures that have bulk. How to, do the, how to communicate the bulk. How do you see the shoulder underneath this long robe, for example? How do you begin to put the figures together? And here, one of my favorites that I brought, that I also don't have, is the, the two nude st uh, studies, where the one is storming out of the composition right at you. And we begin to see him, at this point, putting together the ideas of the nude body, not the clothes, but the nude body, that carries so much weight. He really sees the nude body as carrying emotion and carrying, uh, 
carrying energy in it, and he wants to perfect that. Um, and then when you would do studies in preparatory drawings, and this is in the exhibition, one of the things you see so often is that he does not waste paper. Paper's kind of expensive. It comes mostly, that now paper mills are starting up. It started in Venice in, the, in Europe and it's spreading, but the paper is still expensive. It's not to be wasted. So what he does so often is he starts out and he does the pen and ink drawings, a little more old fashioned, these are probably studies that he was thinking about for the Julius tomb, all those, those sort of ideas about what slaves should be when they're, when they are, that he wanted to decorate the Julius tomb with. This may even be part of the architecture of the proposed Julius tomb. And then he's drawn away from that because he, he's, he, the Pope says, stop, don't do that anymore. I want you to do the Sistine ceiling. And he uses the same piece of paper and goes back and begins to play with these torqued figures that populate the, the, the uh, Sistine ceiling. He loves to take a figure and see how many ways you can twist it. And what I love about this is all the attention he's given to this earlier piece in the red chalk is for this little figure who nobody notices half the time when you're up there. He takes and every figure deserves this kind of attention. When you look at this, you, it, it took, I have to be honest, it took me a while to figure out what figure is that? And I was looking all over and I thought, oh my heavens, there it is. Back in the background, kind of monochromatic with the figure behind it, but nevertheless given a full, almost a half page treatment here as he does it. And then you see him also worried about what does the hand look like on a big book and how do you support it? So he's working through that. And then just, this is here, this is the Mets beautiful Michelangelo drawing, so I thought I really should put it in. Um, and that is obviously for this figure of the Libyan Sybil. Here you certainly see it's a male body uh, that has become a female. But my favorite part of this, I have to say, are these toes, these three toes <laughs> that are here on the edge. Because this entire figure, the torque begins when you push off down there and suddenly the body is snaking up. It's all the pressure comes there, and he's working at it. How do I get that to look natural? How do I get it not to spread too much? How do I get it so it still looks toe-like from down below? And you can see it's, he is somebody who is so controlling of what things are going to, that they be right, that they keep working at it. Um, the other thing that we see is then when you get to the next stage is cartoons. And this is this beautiful cartoon from the Capo di Monte in, in Naples that's in the exhibition. And you, here's the figures right here that that represents on the fresco. You can see that fellow right here. They always look different with color on them, um, but there they are. The cartoons are life size. This is the um, St. Saint Pe Peter being crucified. And the Roman soldiers then surround them. This is, have you, who's been to the exhibit already? So, you know, this is a big drawing. It's a lot of sheets uh, that are all uh, glued together. You can see the lines of the sheets here. To transfer a design to an original work, you have a couple ways in which you can do it. One way is to actually draw on the wall, but it doesn't work so well with fresco because you plaster over that drawing. And you either have to have a great memory or a little bit free, or you don't mind going freestyle when you have to do the final work. You can do what's called pouncing. You prick the outlines of the main figures that you have in your cartoon. You put them against the wall. You take a kind of cheesecloth bundle filled with chalk, and you pounce, you push that dust, that chalk dust, through those holes, and it transfer like a connect the dots to the image that's on the wet plaster, and then you paint from that. But most people prefer to do what we call squaring the drawing. They make squares in it, they make squares on the wall, and it's easier to transfer the design over. What I think is most interesting, this is not pounced, is that he seems to use the, the actual squares that are the paper themselves to be the standard that he's used to bring and transfer over the design. It sort of saves him a step, and I think that's pretty clever. 
Oops, come on. There we go. Oh, I forgot. It's, just, it's such a beautiful drawing. I wanted to bring you a detail. It's because it's so big you can't see the details very well. And you can just see that he's using black chalk and how he's worried about outline. He's constantly reinforcing, trying to figure out what's the best way to separate one figure from the other. Because when you do figures as a group, what happens so often is they get to become an anonymous bundle. So when you, what he, the artists are almost always working on is how you get the shadow in the right place to differentiate one from the other. And then the last thing, the last category is, are these finished drawings, the kind that you give as gifts. They take a lot of time. And the wonderful thing with the exhibition upstairs is that this finished drawing, the one on the right, that was done for Tommaso di Cavalieri um, in the 1530s, this is known to us in three separate drawings, and all three are upstairs. That's, I gotta tell you, that's like when your art historical heart just does a little cha-cha. That is amazing <laughs> to be able to see how he went through this and how it developed over time. These are the last two that I, I, I brought, both of them in, in Britain. One of them has an actual note on the bottom where he says, if this is what you like, I'll finish it up. I'll do it the right, I'll do it <laughs> this way. And if you need to make any corrections, let me know. And that's what we, we see here that this is him finishing and talking about this fall of Phaeton. And he, by, you can see from the finished product that they must have gone back and forth, he and Tommaso, to change some of the basics of the composition. Because the finished product does not look like the one he sent. He said, if you like it, I'll do it this way. He's changed it. Now you have to know a couple things about, uh, about Michelangelo. One of the things is that he is, has a very, he's very traditionally pious. He believes in salvation. He believes in salvation through faith. And he will talk about this till the cows come home. On the other hand, he is someone who is very controlling. He wants to keep everything under control for himself. He loved Florence, spent most, but spent most of his time in Rome. And he was a homosexual. And I will say something, when I was a young student, we never talked about this. Never. They, we, used, we read the sonnets. The sonnets had been translated in the Victorian period where they changed all the pronouns <coughs> from he to she. And so it, this was like, this is one of those moments where you explain so much that we always wondered about. Um, but it also lets us see his relationship to the world and what he, and Tommaso is one of his great loves. He's always concerned about his reputation. And for Michelangelo, beauty is found in power. Beauty is found in strength. So with all that having been said, I want to talk just a little bit about this drawing of, to, of the fall of Phaeton. I don't know if you know the story. It's like not one of your top 10 myths. But it is, it is a great one because it's a little bit like Icarus. The story is Phaeton is the son of Apollo, the sun god. And as all young adolescents do, he kind of asks if he could borrow the car. <laughs> he basically whines at his dad until his dad says, yes, okay, you can drive the sun chariot. <laughs> but he can't control it. <laughs> and he goes way up high and, this, and the earth becomes too cold. And he dips down low and it gets too hot. And finally the other gods go to Jupiter and they say, take this kid out. And so Jupiter sends down a lightning bolt that causes the chariot to fall out of the sky. And down below, we see this river god. He falls into the river and dies, I have to say. Sad story. And his sisters whine and basically moan a bit um, down below in sadness. And they become trees as a result. The grove grows up in his honor. His brother, who is in the river, becomes a swan, although she, he looks a little bit like a duck in this one. And here he is much more swan-like. And, and this is a story of hubris. It's a story of asking for too much and getting shot down in the process. And I love this story because Tommaso de Cavalieri was one of several young men that Michelangelo fell in love with in various ways. And many of them became his lovers. But Tommaso didn't. Tommaso was a young nobleman. It was a bridge too far, so to speak, 
um, and he, while they remained friends. In fact, Tommaso was at his bedside when he died 30 years later, but they never had a sexual relationship. And I always think when I look at this, that that sense of hubris of having been shot down, so to speak, that sadness that comes with it that we see down below is something that's in this drawing of Phaeton. It says something about his relationship to Tommaso and what we, how we all feel when someone we love does not reciprocate in the way we would like. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that, as you probably know, we have a lot of drawings from Michelangelo and we have a lot that are missing. In part of his control, he would burn his drawings. He would throw them into the fire when the project was done. And in his last year of his life, he's throwing all the extra stuff in there, which I just have to say. As an art historian, it just makes you weep. <laughs> so what we have are have this status of relics. We really we love to look at them. We study them. We call them. We probably extract too much information from them because it's what we've got. But when you look at them from the early body study, which we have here on the screen, which is also upstairs at the exhibit. Um, you see this figure in the back of the Battle of Kashina. This is the study for it. And the Battle of Kashina was uh, done, or was meant to be done, in the Palazzo Vecchio in, in Florence. It was a room that was going to celebrate Florentine power. On one wall, it had been given over to Leonardo for his Battle of Anghieri. And he actually did most of his. It was finished. Um, across the way was Michelangelo, who always saw Leonardo as his greatest rival, as well as, well as Raphael. Um, one older, one younger. And Michelangelo always said slightly cutting things about these guys, let's just say. I did say, I, I have, this is an aside, but as I walked up the steps of the Met today, I was looking around to see where they put Michelangelo and those tondi they have in the front, and I thought, oh, he would not like this. <laughs> he, the center door has Dürker and Rembrandt. It's like, whoa. And Michelangelo's one over, and he's paired with Raphael. And I thought, oh, man, he would hate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so here he is trying to figure out how to make something better than Leonardo. They're going to be on opposite walls. He's the, young, he's the young whippersnapper in this. He needs to show this older guy he knows what he's doing. And he does a composition that is a battle about Florentine history, where we have these wonderful soldiers taking a break, swimming in the river, getting cool, and then the Pavian army comes up and they attack. And they're, so they're jumping out of the water. They're trying to help each other. They're getting dressed. You can see them over here and they're getting their weapons to be able to stave off the Pavian army. So it is a study in movement. It is energy personified, and it's the human body in absolutely every active pose you can think of. It is a kind of in your face to Leonardo. He never got to make it. He got called away to Rome. He had done a huge life-size cartoon, we know that, uh, which we've, is lost to us. But people had made engravings from it, which is what we see here. And we, there's actually a painting upstairs that is, is based on it. As he gets more involved, as he gets further along in his career, when he's doing the Sistine ceiling, he does a series, uh, and this is obviously for Adam in the creation of Adam, he, of body pictures where I think it's fascinating to, com to compare them to the original, and I should have put the, the, the final fresco on here, and I didn't. Um, but I'm going to make you do this when you go home. Uh, what you have is an actual living presence, a person who he is copying when they're laying there. We see the, the, kind, the way the muscles move. We see him trying to get the right outline. He's moving this all the time, trying to see what's going to give the right thickness, what's going to be the right way to do it. And he has this sort of break down the center where you can almost see the ribs going out on either side. The muscles are bunched. This is a live body. And when he has to take it and put it on the Sistine ceiling, the body has to look a little more languid because it hasn't got life given to it yet. And what you have to see when you look at these and compare them is what, how he has taken this living body and made it begin to undo itself, relax, etc. 
Oops, that's here. I'm going to talk about two, two last things, and I'm going to show you a, a surprise, and then we're done. Um, we have a type called the Madonna lactans, the Madonna who is, is nursing the child on her lap. It's an old traditional type, and I show you one of the, an earlier version down below here on the right. And this is also in the exhibition, and this is a drawing that I think is just such a wonderful example of Michelangelo taking on a traditional subject matter and changing it. Traditionally, when the Madonna and child are seen together and the child is at the breast, there's this kind of tenderness in the face of the Madonna, and they tend to gaze into one another's eyes, and we see them as a team. It is that moment of motherhood that's stressed. When Michelangelo does it, the Virgin looks away, and the child, instead of looking like a tiny child, looks like a young Hercules. He's like a baby Hercules. <laughs> he, he's got a really, you know, he's been working out. And, <laughs> and so you see this figure, you see him here, um, completely focused on the breast, which is lovely. But it's also, I think, a wonderful comment about what we have here, which is she can't bear to look. She looks into the future, and her face is just horrified. You know, she sees what's coming, and this hope that we have, because he was a hopeful man about salvation, is because this child looks so heroic that we know he's going to over, he's going to, uh, he's going to st save us from death if, when this all happens. But the virgin kind of, as the human person sort of fades away, and Christ as the holy figure is really developed. So this is one of those times we see him playing with tradition and changing it completely. And the other thing I wanted to show you is the fact that he did for a friend of his, Vittoria Colonna, wonderful friend, very pious woman, a Marchesa who was a widow at this point. They wrote sonnets back and forth. He does a series of, paint, of drawings for her, finished drawings. And I wanted to show his early carved crucifix and his la one he does for Vittoria. Um, because he changes, and I always say this to my students, when you go to do a crucifix, and there's lots of them out there, you have two choices. You can show Christ dead. And if Christ is dead, he is the human figure who has given up. It is, it is man's suffering that you see. Or you could have him awake, and he is heroic. And that's what he changes. In his early life, he does, he stresses the humanity of Christ. In his later life, it is the hero, hero, the hero who's going to save us. Much more muscular, striving up, not confined by the cross, looking up to God and reminding us that despite death, here at the, he, there is victory at the end. And that's what this man represents. The last thing I'm going to show you is that a couple years, well, it's not a couple anymore, 76. <laughs> Most of you weren't born yet. Um, but <laughs> 76, um, they discovered by accident, underneath the new sacristy in Florence, this room that we think is Michelangelo. It's up for debate. It's, people are talking about it. It, was, it. it matches what Michelangelo tells us. When he went back to Florence, when the Republic was there, the Medici were kicked out. He had 15 months of working for the Republic, and then the Medici come back, and they take the city back. And when that happens, he is put down into a place where he says, uh, I hid in a tiny cell, entombed like the dead Medici above me, though hiding from a living one, a living Medici. To forget my fears, I filled the walls with drawings. He's there two months. And when they found this, we think it is him. We think this may be the cell that he's talking about underneath the Medici that were dead above him. Um, it is beautiful, large, life-size drawings. And this summer, it's going to be open to the public. And the last thing I want to show you is then when he gets out after two months interned, I think, although nobody will believe me but me, I think he does this drawing, this drawing of resurrection, of blast, blasting out of the tomb, of Christ who is throwing his hands up in the air to feel air once again, to be back on the earth. And I think that works too for Michelangelo, who was interred for that time. Thank you.
That was wonderful, Jane. Thanks so much. No problem. I'm going to speak from the podium. I learned early on in my career that it's wise when you're speaking to students, especially to have a solid object between you and your, your vital <laughs> organs and the, the audience. Um, <clears throat> but I may walk around a little bit if I feel safe enough. Uh, thank you, Robin, and uh, to your team for putting this all together. Uh, and, and thank you all uh, for uh, for coming out. Um, there are a lot of reasons to be grateful for being a professor at a place like Dartmouth, um, uh, not the least of them, the wonderful, wonderful students. And it turns out that the wonderful, wonderful students go on to be wonderful, wonderful human beings. Uh, and so the opportunity to interact not just with the students but with alumni is really wonderful. Uh, so thank you all for that and for your uh, continued involvement and, and generosity. It makes it possible for people like Jane and I to do things like this. So I'm not an expert on the Renaissance uh, or on, on Michelangelo, uh, but I know a thing or two about the history of the concept of genius. And so I thought what I'd do this afternoon is talk a little bit about the history of genius in connection to, to Michelangelo and pose uh, what on the surface may seem a fairly straightforward question. Right? Was Michelangelo a genius? If you've just seen the, 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 the exhibit or if you're about to, you're probably thinking to yourself, what a stupid question, right? Of course he's a genius, right? That's why we're here, right? Well, you have that cult and that mythology to thank for the, the, the crowds there. A lot of people in that exhibition don't normally come to the Met, but uh, that, that's a good thing in some ways, right? Genius has been in the news a lot uh, of late. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We use the word rather liberally in the 21st century, right? <laughs> Geniuses can be cartoon characters, right? They can be rock stars. They can be pastry chefs. They can be work in commercial real estate, okay? <laughs> you too can be a genius, right? You can learn to think like Michelangelo, okay? Right? Genius in our age is ordinary. There's little genius in all of us. Well, all that may be uplifting, uh, but it doesn't help very much in figuring out what this thing, genius, really is. Okay? And it turns out that critics and commentators, researchers and scientists have struggled for centuries to try to pin genius down. In the 18th century, the physiognomist uh, Lafater uh, thought he could detect genius in the folds of the, of the face or the sparkle of the eye. In the 19th century, craniometrists thought that they could detect genius in the size or shape of the skull. That's Immanuel Kant's skull that was disinterred in 1880 so they could prove he was a genius, right? <clears throat> Others believed that they could diagnose genius as if it were a condition or even an affliction. So this man, Cesare Lombroso, made a renowned career across Europe and the Americas in the 19th century as a physician and psychologist explaining that genius was a kind of degenerative disease, right? that could be detected in what he called the stigmata of the body, various physical deformities, ticks and signs and the like. Those stigmata, however, proved on closer inspection to be falsely alluring, and the same can be said of attempts to locate genius more recently in the brain uh, or the scale of IQ. Right? It's a little slide from Einstein's brain. As you probably know, Einstein's brain was harvested against uh, his, his explicit uh, uh, his, his, he didn't want it to happen against his explicit uh, will and uh, preserved and sort of tests are run on it and periodically you'll read in the newspaper that they've discovered, you know, the place where genius is right there in the, uh, uh, in the brain. And so a little slide here. Well, the point I'm making with all this is that genius resists easy identification and even easy definition precisely because it's not a universal condition or an unchanging fact of nature. The great philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche famously said that only that which has no history can be defined. Defined, he meant universally uh, for all times in all places, the way that you would define a, a right triangle, say, or an atom. Well, genius quite clearly has a history. It morphs and it changes. It revolves uh, and, and, and evolves to suit the times. <clears throat> and in this respect, genius is not stable at all. In the end, it's a label that we use to identify qualities in people we admire, and not surprisingly, 
what people admire and how they do so is subject to change over time. Now, the period in which people first began to use the term genius to describe exalted individuals, to single out special human beings as geniuses, was actually fairly recently, only uh, in the 18th century, which witnessed, uh, which witnessed the birth of the genius as a new kind of cultural hero and gave rise to a cult of genius that continued uh, into the 19th uh, and 20th centuries. And that's, that's, a, that's kind of the main theme of, of the book uh, that Robin mentioned, Divine Fury, A History of Genius. And what that age, the Age of Enlightenment, chose to admire and it is revealing. This was a time, recall, when people were becoming less confident that the world was animated by supernatural beings, by angels and demons, by gods and gods. It was also an age of incipient individualism, when men and women sought to define their selves as selves, unique, original, one of a kind. It was also an age when artists and scientists, writers and musicians began to break away from the patronage system in which they had long worked as court employees or kings and aristocrats. Now forced to sell their wares on the open market, they emphasized their unique attributes, their originality, their creativity, their genius as a way to create for themselves a kind of market niche. The cult of genius as it emerged in the 18th and 19th centuries hit all of these notes. Geniuses were consummate individuals. They were original, both in the sense that they created originally and also often because they seemed a little different from others, right? a little strange, a little odd, a little queer. They had visions that others didn't. They saw where others could not. They defied convention and broke established rules in order to establish their own. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant was an important theorist of genius in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, explained that geniuses, quote, give the rules to art. Right? They, they write the norms, they rewrite the norms. Everyone agrees, Kant continued, that genius must be considered the very opposite of a spirit of imitation, from which it followed that originality must be its foremost property. Genius, as Wordsworth would later say, is the introduction of a new element into the intellectual universe. Genius, geniuses embodied this creative capacity, and in doing so, they became more than mere men. Seemingly godlike in their capacity to see into the universe or to see into our souls, they were a modern replacement for the saints and spiritual, spiritual intercessors of old. And that's a theme that I, I take up at some length in the, in the book. Um, and I'll just show you a couple images here. This is the frontispiece from Voltaire's uh, Elements of the Philosophy of Newton, which is a kind of summary of uh, Newton's philosophy. And Newton, like Michelangelo, and really like all the figures I'll be talking about, was also extremely good at self-promotion. It turns out that geniuses are always good at promoting themselves. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what's interesting about this slide to me, though, is that there's Newton, right? And, and he's literally guiding uh, the light of God, divine light off the mirror of Madame de Chatelet, his translator into French and also Voltaire's uh, lover, uh, down to the pen of Voltaire. So it's genius inspiring uh, genius. Uh, this is uh, Fragonard's uh, famous uh, 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 drawing to the uh, in, in, in genius of Benjamin Franklin, who's uh, very much a part of this cult of genius, especially in Europe in the 18th century. He's a man who literally pulls lightning from the sky. Right? and scepters from the hands of, uh, of tyrants. <clears throat> That's Fragonard himself. Uh, and what interests me about this, uh, this image, and Jane would expand, is it very much recalls uh, earlier uh, depictions of saints, right? Uh, who are detecting a kind of divine presence uh, somewhere, somewhere else. And there's Napoleon, who's very much a part of the story, uh, and the cult of genius, who's literally referred to as le génie, uh, the genius uh, for uh, most of uh, the imperial period. And here he is as a master of the universe. It's the whole cult of Napoleon's star or comet like Caesar's a, kind of has a divine uh, connection to, with, the, with the heavens, a man, a man of fate. Okay, so the, the cult of genius born uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, lionizes people like Newton or Napoleon or Benjamin Franklin and indeed, people like Shakespeare uh, and Michelangelo. 
right? Shakespeare is invented as a genius uh, in the 18th century, right? Obviously, he was a fairly good poet prior to that, right? A playwright, but he's not talked about as a genius, and the same is true of Michelangelo, right? Um, when the 19th century French romantic painter uh, Eugène Delacroix uh, encountered the work of Michelangelo, he could only exclaim, oh, sublime genius. And he and other 19th century observers really fashioned Michelangelo in their own image, making of him a modern or romantic genius, tropes that then get picked up and reiterated by uh, biographers and art historians uh, into the 20th century, and in a subtle way, just sort of repeated in the, in the show that you see today. Now, there was a certain logic to this move, to be sure, uh, even if it was also uh, distorting. But in order to appreciate that, we need first to get a sense of how earlier ages spoke uh, of their own eminent uh, figures of, uh, of eminent achievement. You know, I printed this out in 14 point uh, 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 type, and I used to be able to get away with 14 point without glasses, and it's just not working anymore, so I'm gonna <laughs> go to the specs. 16 point next time. <clears throat> so how, in other words, did people understand genius before the birth of the genius? Or as the Roman statesman, and, uh, philosopher Cicero asked in the first century BCE, what was this quidum duinum, right, this divine something, this X factor that set the truly gifted apart? Now, Cicero's terms are revealing, for it was difficult, if not impossible, for many ancients and for many people thereafter, including especially uh, their Renaissance heirs, to imagine human greatness without some kind of divine aid. Great individuals enjoyed divine favor and divine assistance. Either they were possessed by a higher power or they were possessors of some inherent quality bestowed upon them at birth. So think of Homer. We were talking about Homer before the uh, uh, lecture started. Uh, the greatest of the ancient poets, prophets, and bards. Right? Homer was inspired, it was believed, right? blown into by divine breath, and it helps to keep in mind that the word uh, inspire comes from the Latin spirare, to, to, to blow, right? Homer is filled up by the breath of the muses, the breath of the gods, and he tells us this right at the very beginning of the Iliad and the Odyssey, both of which begin in literal translation with an incantation, right? Sing in me muse of the anger of Achilles. Sing in me muse of the man of twists and turns. Inhabit my body, take, take over, speak through me. Right? The bard becomes a kind of medium who's taken over and possessed by a divine voice. Plato, very famously in his dialogues, The Ion and the Phaedrus, developed a whole theory of this process, which he likened somewhat disparagingly to a kind of mania or madness. And the poet prophet or seer is caught up in what he calls the divine fury, right? creative possession, a manic trance or possession uh, blown into him by God, and hence, hence the, the title of my book. <clears throat> so that's one way of conceiving of artistic or intellectual greatness. The other is to consider why someone like Homer should attract the favor of the gods in the first place. And one influential answer is that these kinds of people have different kinds of souls different natures, right, that they possess something that others don't. Now, Aristotle uh, developed this line of inquiry, asking uh, in an influential text that's a, now, it, well, it was attributed to him. We now know that it was written by someone else, probably one of his students. Um, but it poses this question. Why is it right, that eminent people uh, all suffer uh, uh, from uh, an ultra bilis, uh, uh, a melancholy temperament. Right? So the, the governing logic here is, uh, is the ancient notion that all human constitutions are controlled by four principal humors, right? black bile, yellow bile, uh, phlegm, or blood. Right? You still speak of people as phlegmatic or sanguine. Right? And the idea is that people who have a su superabundance of black bile um, are, uh, are more prone to uh, eminence in, in, in these fields than others, right? They have different kinds of souls. There's also a side effect, which is melancholy, right? And that word, of course, is from the Greek black uh, bile, right? So even the ancients are thinking about this connection between genius and madness, and it turns out that has a long, long history, which is a, another subject in its own right. 
Okay, so in the West, at least, these are the two general ideal types for thinking about human eminence in matters uh, created. It's either an original possession, a gift of God, inscribed in the body and soul, or is something that possesses us, that takes us over, that fills us with inspiration. In practice, though, these two conceptions were most often combined. Right? People with great souls drew the favor of the gods, and people who drew the favor of the gods necessarily had great souls. They were both possessors and possessed. You get a vivid sense of this uh, conflation in the Roman cult of the genius, right? a word that, as you can see, is spelled just like our modern term genius, and of course we take the word directly from the Latin, which itself derives from the verb gigno gignore, meaning to bring into being or to generate or to beget. It's the same root that uh, gives us words like gene and genital. And that's fitting because the Roman genius is a god of birth, a sort of guardian companion who watches over all males from birth to death, acting as an intercessor to the divine, a tutelary spirit, or a guardian angel. It's a votive statue that would have been in almost every Roman home uh, by the end of the Republic. In the ancient understanding, some people's genii were greater than others, right? just as some had greater ingenium, right? greater um, natural uh, or inherent aptitude or, or character, and that word ingenium is formed uh, just from the accusative uh, of, of, of genius, right? the genius in us. The genius in them was simply more powerful. And there's a whole classical tradition devoted to speculating about the genie of great men, the most famous being that uh, of Socrates, uh, or what in Greek, uh, the genius of Socrates, rather, or what in Greek was known as his daimonion, his little demon, right, which is the root of our modern uh, term demon, uh, but that gets translated invariably in Latin as genius. Right? Socrates, too, had a genius right, that watched over him in keeping with his great nature, giving him uncommon insight and power for Socrates as the Oracle at Delphi had famously proclaimed was the wisest man who lived. Right? It's a more recent depiction. It's fact by Delacroix. It's in the uh, French National Assembly. And you'll see there that the, the genius looks a lot like a Christian angel, and that's not coincidental because this Roman cult of genius uh, fed into a Christian cult of guardian angels and saints. And indeed, if you look up the word genius in European language as well into the 17th century, you'll invariably find a definition that looks like this one here, uh, or like that of uh, Henry Cockerham's English Dictionary of 1623. Genius, the soul entry reads, uh, a good angel or a familiar evil spirit, the soul, and you, you note that the genius may be either good or evil, and there's a long Christian tradition then uh, uh, of thinking about how the soul is accompanied not only by a, a good genius, a guardian angel, but uh, an evil genius or demon. And so here you have a Christian uh, knight with a guardian angel and evil genius on the side. Dartmouth alumni are probably familiar with that image, a more modern iteration of the same general idea. It's sort of less funny than it once was uh, after Me Too, uh, but um, nonetheless, you get the idea. So you hear echoes in many later Christian accounts of the classical discussion of divine fury or divine natures, divine ingenium. And that is true especially in the Renaissance, right? When Plato's notion of the divine fury and the Aristotelian conception of the souls of great men were self-consciously revived and spread and applied to outstanding individuals like Michelangelo Leonardo, who gets spoken about as divinely inspired or in possession of divine natures, divine ingenium, with its propensity for melancholy. When Giorgio Vasari, uh, the Florentine painter and memorialist whom Jane mentioned earlier, published the first edition of his celebrated Lives of the Painters in 1550, while Michelangelo was still alive, he referred to Michelangelo as divino, divine, no fewer than 20 times, uh, nearly 40 times in the second edition of 1568 after his death. The use of the epithet divine to describe a sculptor or painter was in part performative, right? an attempt to insist that these mere artisans were something more. Right? But it was also an innovation, right? hitherto reserved by and large for the saints. Right? Saints were only the only people who could describe as divine. Right? Maybe Dante, maybe Petrarch, but it's really not until the end of the 15th century when Brunelleschi, the great architect, earns the label that it starts being applied 
uh, to artists, okay? and above all to super artists, as, as the Oxford art historian Martin Kemp has described them. Michelangelo is the greatest of them all. At the time of his death, his saintly and angelic gifts appeared more radiant than ever. And I have an account uh, in my book of Michelangelo's funeral and the later translation of his body from Rome to uh, Santa Croce Cathedral in, in Florence, where he's now buried. And he's literally treated like a saint. Right? People claim that his body didn't putrefy like, like a saint's body. Uh, mourners affix messages and fragments of verse to his con coffin, giving voice to their reverence. Unequaled through all ages past, Michelangelo was a true angel, vero angelo, a divine angel, angelo divino, whose lofty ingenio, just the Italian for ingenium, was ready with its glance and wings for so high a flight. Later, at the official memorial services held at the Basilica of San Lorenzo, uh, an honor hitherto reserved only for princes, the humanist Benedetto Varchi pronounced a eulogy that soared to even greater heights. Michelangelo, endowed with the very strongest and most capacious ingenio, was not just a human being of the highest excellence, but a celestial and divine man, more divine than human, singular and unique, a producer of marvels and miracles. Should I call him an angel, Varchi wondered, or an archangel, even more divine? Not only can we believe, he insisted, but we must believe that Michelangelo was chosen in heaven and sent to earth by God. So Michelangelo, in this rendering and in many others, is both possessor and possessed, possessor of divine ingenium and the vessel of divine inspiration. Now, we're certainly getting close in this Renaissance discussion of great artists to something like a modern conception of genius. And it's revealing that in the 16th century, the Italian genio, the word for the Latin genius, began to be applied to the phenomena of divine fury. And then gradually, by the end of the century, it gets conflated with ingenio or ingenium, so that genius, and this happens in English and French as well, began to mean both one's innate capacity and divine fury or inspiration associated with uh, higher, higher beings. It's understandable, moreover, why the Romantics would fasten on to a person like Michelangelo as a brother in arms. Right? He was endlessly productive. He worked in many, many mediums. He was constantly innovating. He was irascible and even something of a bad boy, right? not afraid to put even the Pope in his place. He was undoubtedly different, if not queer, a loner, prone to fits of melancholy, and given to a kind of obsession with his work, right? bathing infrequently and sleeping in his clothes. And yet, if in these ways Michelangelo seems a romantic genius, I would caution that we're not quite there yet. And that's largely because the modern understanding of genius is predicated to such an extent on the belief in total originality. Remember that for Kant, genius involved doing or thinking or making what no one had ever done before. Genius doesn't imitate. It breaks the established rules and indeed is in self inimitable. That belief is in many ways second nature to us now. We value creation and creativity, and our entire economy, backed by a legal system of intellectual copyright, operates on the assumption that to create is to create something new. But in truth, that is a recent and fairly radical departure. Because really, until the 18th century, creation and a notion of creative originality were, strictly speaking, not deemed possible. Why? Well, I'm simplifying somewhat, but in brief, human beings had thought of, and they'd always thought of, the world either as having existed forever, or, as in the Jewish and Christian accounts, as having been created by God at a certain point of time, created complete and in its entirety. And so it followed that everything that exists, right? Every idea, every form, every innovation exists already, right? Had it, it had been conceived, thought of, anticipated by the ultimate creator, God himself. I'm just going to wrap it up here real quickly, but you get a really nice sense of this in, in uh, the etymology of words. So think of the word to discover, right? Until the 18th century, it simply means to reveal what's been there all along, right? To take, take the cover off, right? To... Uh, pull away the veil, 
um, to see what uh, has been right before our eyes. The same is true with the word uh, to invent or invention from the Latin invenire. Uh, the, in German, uh, you still say erfinden, uh, to find, right? To invent is, something, is simply to find something, something you may have missed before again, but that was there and has been always. Create is the most interesting. There's a theological dictum, solus deus creat, right? God alone creates, right? Human beings don't create, right? The best uh, that they can do uh, is uh, aspire uh, to imitate uh, the perfect forms that had always existed or that had been revealed to us by God. Right? In art, uh, this is called mimesis. And that's the dominant paradigm throughout the Renaissance. And it's not explicitly in cha challenged until the 18th century with the emergence of the modern notions of originality and genius and the attendant view that creators are the owners uh, of their creations. Copyright law and the assumption that a copy is really a cheap knockoff, an imitation, a theft, is a product of that same shift. But in the Renaissance, the ideal of mimesis or of imitation still holds. And so even though someone like Michelangelo is surely innovating like no one had done before, right? And Vasari even says that he didn't follow the, quote, measures, orders, and rules men usually employ. And Michelangelo himself tries to give you that indication, although I think it's really uh, one nice aspect of the show here, that you begin with his grounding uh, in, uh, in, in the workshop and his uh, mentorship, under, or rather his uh, apprenticeship under people like Ghirlandaio, uh, Masaccio, and others, right? He's taking on these traditions. So despite his claims to the contrary, there is really not the same tendency to speak of Michelangelo's originality or of his genius in a modern sense. Rather, he's particularly good at imitating, right? at recreating, at representing God and nature's perfection. He's even better than the ancients in this regard, as Vasari observes, so good that he's treated at his death as a kind of heavenly being, right? a man apart. But he also, as, as Jane mentioned, works extremely hard. Right? He combines his ingenium with what the ancient calls ars. Right? My students always laugh when I say that cultivated skill, right? practice, dedication, craft, long hours of toil, which in an artistic tradition going all the way back to Horace is the, um, the, 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 inevitable, um, uh, the, the inevitable partner of uh, ingenium. You have to have ingenium and ars to create great things in art. In this respect, then, Michelo, Michelangelo does follow the rules, and he masters them as much as he breaks them. He inscribes himself in traditions that owe as much to the old as they do to the new. All right, well, where does that leave us? Was Michelangelo a genius? Well, sure, right? Call him that if you like. I'm not a uh, word policeman, right? But realize that in so doing, you're imposing on him a category that neither he nor his contemporaries would have recognized. And if history be, as I take it, the act of listening to the dead on their terms and not ours, then we would perhaps do better to think of Michelangelo as a man with gifts both inborn and inspired, a man with a genius, right, who put it to work with training and cultivation and practice in the service of his God, his patrons, and himself. And in the process, he represented the world with such beauty and skill that he seemed to his contemporaries to have transcended humanity in the only way they knew. He was Michael of the angels, a man divine. All right. Um, we've run a little bit over time here, uh, but I believe that we have uh, uh, a, a bit of time for questions uh, to both Jane and myself. So uh, I think they're going to bring some. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I think they're going to bring mics down, and if you, uh, you know, want to. Uh, if they could bring the lights up, that would be great. Oh, I went on. Do we need that? Yeah. Or if someone has a strong voice, we can, we can repeat what you say. I love the anecdote of <clears throat> Charles, Charles de Gaulle, you know, famously at press conferences. 
if he didn't hear the question he wanted, he would just pretend like he heard it, right? So at the, this <laughs> awkward time at the beginning, I can say, oh, that's a really interesting question. Like somebody, somebody just asked. <laughs> uh, careful. We answered all your questions. Absolutely. It's all clear. Yeah. Please. Thank you. That was uh, truly stellar. Uh, my name is Dorothy Price Hill, class of 88. Uh, I have a question about uh, Michelangelo's parents. Uh, we don't hear much about them unless one were studying his life. Uh, could you please comment on his mother and father, as well as any other relatives who influenced him, especially in his uh, pious daily faith and any prayers that he did on a regular basis. I'd be very interested in that. Thank you. What do you do for a living? Um, I am, I work on Wall Street in compliance. Oh, okay. I thought, <laughs> darn, I thought maybe, I thought maybe you were like a psychologist. I was, <laughs> right. <clears throat> no, Go for it. Um, his mother really doesn't come up very much. I do think she died young. His father is actually a sort of minor nobility. And when um, Condivi writes his bi biography, he actually puffs them up a little bit. They look a little more noble than they really were. But his father had, was a, a kind of what we would call probably middle management guy who lived in the hills outside Florence and managed land for the, um, for the count of the area and was fairly influential in the sense that for a family who was noble to have their son go into a trade, which is what art was thought to be, it shows a great for, a sort of um, acceptance on his father's part to let him break away from that tradition of being part of the um, acceptable middle class, we would call it, um, and really taking a chance. So he is the one who begins, who actually puts him into Ghirlandaio's workshop and says, okay, see what, how it works, see what happens. Um, and he, I, I will be honest, I don't know exactly when he fades out of the picture, but for a long time he's very active in Michelangelo's life and supportive, which is unusual. His yeah. parents played baby Michelangelo recordings to him in the crib when he was growing <laughs> up as well. So. <laughs> the daunting microphone. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you, um, in your presentation, discussed uh, how there was a shift in the perception of genius from create from imitation to creating and I was wondering if you could speak to why that transition occurred yeah. this time was it with heightened globalization sure. kind of just coming across yeah. the foreign more often it's a great question uh, and it's uh, not an easy one to answer quickly I spent a lot of time developing that in the book but I, I think it's multi-causal um, and I alluded to one explanation in, in my comments um, and it, in fact it's the the explanation that Michel Foucault, the great French philosopher, famously used to explain the birth of the writer in the uh, 18th century. And he says that, you know, when writers and musicians and artists start leaving uh, the court patronage system, they've got to go out there and, and sell themselves, right? And they have to distinguish themselves. And genius becomes a way of sort of saying, hey, I'm different and better from that person, right? So that's, I think, one of the things that's going on is change in the sociology of art. I think also, and there are lots of other reasons, but the other critical one that, that is really the argument in my book is that the 18th century is a period in which um, it's, it's too easy to say that it's an atheist age, it's not at all, but it's a, an age of uh, a great change in religious conceptions. And it becomes harder and harder for people to imagine uh, intermedi intermediary be beings, what the Germans call them Mittelmächte, right? Uh, angels and demons and uh, all these uh, higher beings that inhabit the space between mere mortals and God. And geniuses, in effect, step into that place, and they become kind of secular saints. And this is very clear. I mean, in the 19th century, uh, there's not only this study of craniums, but there's, there are, people are buying and selling the relics of genius, right? Literally. I mean, I, I have an account of uh, somebody, somebody purchases a little piece of bone that's, you know, somebody claims to be the penis of Napoleon. And they're paying good money for this stuff, right? Because it's, you know, it's, it's as if it's filled with this kind of magical prowess, like saints. And so I think that's the, the other main thing here. Uh, what books could you recommend that would help us best understand uh, Michelangelo as uh, both the man and his art? Oh, wow. Jim, Jim Saslow's books. Um, Jim Saslow, who was just recently retired uh, with Queens College, I, I think he really blew open the door to Michelangelo's studies. 
And then David Summers, it's a little older now, it came out in the 80s, but his idea about the poetics of art really begins to break down all those terms we use and throw around like disegno and, and poesia and all that, and begins to give us concrete ideas about how to handle that. So Thank you. Summers, Saslow. Thank you. <laughs> More where that came from. Uh, obviously, I should read the book, but getting back to genius, does it exist without the self-promotion? Well, I mean, this is a good question, right? Um, and, you know, it, it, one of the points that I try to make is that it's, you know, it's always very difficult to put your finger on it and say just what it is. I mean, a, another great example of this is the psychologist Lewis Terman, right, who's the person who effectively instrumentalizes the IQ exam. The IQ exam had been developed in France uh, to actually measure sort of minimum intelligence, uh, and Terman sort of makes it so we can do the opposite. And he does this big study in California is that... Uh, uh, at Stanford, um, and he's going to only take people who have an IQ of 140 or above. Okay? Well, two future Nobel uh, uh, Prize winners, Louis Alvarez and William Shockley, don't meet the mark, right? They're not, they're not smart enough to be in his study, but they win Nobel Prizes. And so I think that's another indication of the way in which you know, saying what a genius really is uh, is very difficult, and the, the self-promotion uh, part of it is... Uh, it's great. On the other hand, you know, there's a whole tradition that says, well, you, you recognize genius when you see it or when you hear it, right? Uh, and, uh, I mean, my bigger point here would be that, that people have an investment in believing in kind of marvelous, miraculous people who are more than mere mortals. And I think that explains the crowds at this show, right? Hoping for a little bit of, little bit of revelation you know, when we encounter these people. Come in here. Uh, one question, I guess, from the left side. Three words <laughs> starting with N. Michelangelo, marketing, and madness. So mm -hmm. my question is, how much of the genius of Michelangelo would be there without the marketing? And what's the relationship of the genius with madness? You want to start? OK, I'll, yeah, I'll, do, I'll do the madness, you do the marketing, all right? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> no, I like to go. No, I so, was going to start. No, no, please, go, please. Go, Oh dear, now we've done our, gotten ourselves into a, in a stew. Um, in general, I think, if I'm doing marketing? Okay. Yeah, you um, can do madness too if you want. Marketing is, is something that Michelangelo did all the time, but he did it with finding patrons. Because when you get the right patron at that time, he gets, you get a publicity that is, is unmatched, perhaps, for us today. So when you go to the popes, when the popes command you to do things, you have, in that sense, achieved mar you know, marketing nirvana. You are there in the midst of power, and power with unlimited funds, which is the best kind of power to have, as we all know. Um, so for Michelangelo, marketing came by finding the right patrons. He starts with the Medici. He gets trained at their court, powerful family. He ends up being called by the popes. Half of them are Medici popes, but it's kind of all tied together. And he, he never really leaves that elite circle. So that is a karma that is hard to, to uh, compare to somebody like Cosimo, de, um, was it, was, oh, something, Perino del Vaga, we'll go with him. Um, one of those people who didn't have that kind of, if you want to call it luck in his life, didn't have those kind of connections. And is, is a lovely painter, but does never have, doesn't ever reach that universally understood and known quality that you get with Michelangelo. So two things, really quickly. One, um, there's a wonderful book by a French colleague of mine named Antoine Lilti, which has been translated as a history of celebrity. Uh, and the 18th century not only sees the birth of the genius, but the birth of celebrity. And one of the points that Antoine makes in his book is that celebrity requires a, a, a kind of print culture so that you can feel close to people who are actually very far away. And I think you can make a similar argument about genius, yeah. right? Uh, Michelangelo has fame, what the ancients would call fame, surely. Uh, and in fact, that fame spreads fairly far, but it's only with the emergence of print culture that you can start you know, reading about uh, what he ate for breakfast and you know, uh, what his, I don't know, favorite place to go on holiday was, all these kind of investment that we make personally in, in people. Um, the madness thing, so as I say, that goes all the way back to the ancients. Um, 
and it's revived uh, in the Renaissance. And so, as some of you probably know, uh, you know, Michelangelo clearly s seemed to struggle with what we would probably call depression. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, disseminated the myth that he was born under the sign of Saturn. And Saturn, in this kind of complex astrological uh, understanding, was associated with black bile, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, there's a kind of darkness. In the 18th and 19th century, that same idea gets medicalized. I've mentioned uh, Lombroso, and this, I mean, we laugh at it now, but this is big business, right? Um, <clears throat> and it turns out that, you know, I mean, this is a more complicated subject. In, it depends on the domain that you're talking about. In some domains, um, uh, you know, uh, any kind of mental illness doesn't work very well <laughs> for genius. But in other domains, take poetry, for example. What is a poet good at? Making metaphor. What is metaphor? pointing out similarities between dissimilar things. You take that over one standard deviation, and that becomes schizophrenia, right? And there does seem to be a kind of sweet spot right on that line, and it's, I think, not coincidental that many great poets have this, even if that's not causal at all, that there's... Uh, and you can say the same thing about certain kinds of mathematics, but in other fields, uh, novels, for example, it doesn't help to be, you know, second-guessing yourself all the time. So in part, that, that association is a mythic one. Uh, but in part, it gets at something, I think, that, that peoples have rec recognized in different forms through, through the ages. There was a book that was um, written after the Sistine Chapel was cleaned in the 90s called The Secrets of the Sistine Chapel. I don't know if you're familiar with it. That Little. paints a very different picture of um, Michelangelo. They basically say that they found in the people that they found in the frescoes a lot of heretical um, commentary, a lot of anti-papist uh, commentary. And so that sounds like a different person than the one you were talking about. I wonder if you could comment on that. OK, yeah. I would say two, th well, I say many things to this. <laughs> one is that um, I actually don't believe it. I'll just be all honest about this. I don't think that's true. He is traditionally a very connected to the church throughout his life, and he feels and writes beautiful sacred poetry, which talks about the power of the divine intervention that allows us to have eternal life. I would be truly surprised if he had secret <coughs> divination uh, tendencies or evil or you know sort of heret heretical tendencies. Um, I do think that in the uh, Sistine ceiling, when you read it, it really helps to understand that you enter into the Sistine Chapel and you look up and you are under Zechariah who is shaking his fist at you because he's that kind of prophet. It's, he's a, a negative Nelly about this. And then you go to uh, the scene of the, the drunkenness of Noah, the shame of Noah. And as you move towards the altar, you get at the end Jonah who prefigures Christ with three days in the, in the whale's belly. And you have the creation, the purity of the earth when God begins his creation. So you move from sin to salvation, and you move from sin to purity when you're in the Sistine uh, Chapel. It is a theological march that he gives you in there. And I see the ceiling much more in those terms. I don't really see it as being uh, heretically uh, divination being part of it. Um, there was another question you asked in that, and I'm sorry, I kind of lost it. Okay. There, there were a lot of people, of course, after the Reformation using, you know, pointing their fingers and saying, you're a heretic and so forth, and that explains, I mean, in, including at Michelangelo. Um, but, but the other point I'd make, just to tie this into the, the history of genius, is that I mean, the, the religion of genius or the cult of genius is a, is a cult for people without God. Uh, it's a kind of intellectual's religion. And when it gets going uh, hardcore in the 19th century, there's an effort to sort of strip religion out of the past. So you're probably familiar with Jakob Burkhardt's famous you know, history of the Renaissance when he describes the Renaissance essentially as the 19th century. They're all individuals and they're, they're all secular and, you know, uh, and, and something similar is done with Michelangelo. He's made into a kind of secular hero in a way that he just wasn't. I know what else I was going to say to you. One more thing, and that is... No, I, Pull him off. We can't stop talking. I know, I know, really. But, uh, <laughs> and that is, he, he and Vittoria Colonna, the woman who he was so, such close friends with in the, in the last uh, years of his life, or her life, um, they both were part of a group who believed in reforming the Catholic Church. 
and very much dedicated themselves to that. And then, of course, the Counter-Reformation comes, and he's very happy. We don't call it the Counter-Reformation anymore. We call it the Catholic Reformation, but you know what I mean. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think, so I think you, you will be sick. Uh, Sorry. I think you'll be sticking around a little bit if, if yeah, people sure. have a few more questions. All right. Thank you so much again. <laughs> Thank you.